I grew up in a pretty typical working class family in the 50s and 60s. I, it was a big family. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and um, that's really what I wanted. I, I, some of my friends went off to college. I had no desire to really do that, so my goal was to raise my family and be a full-time mom and, and wife. And met the man that I ended up marrying and decided that I would work so he could go to school and he would have uh, income sufficient for us to raise our family. Um, we'd been married a little over three years, but I became pregnant a little earlier than we planned. But we had our little boy, and then even more unexpectedly, um, I found myself pregnant a second time, and that put a lot of pressure on. And eventually the result of that was, just as he was finishing up his internship to get his certifications and had started a job, um, he decided it was too much responsibility, and that played out in him becoming involved with somebody else, and it caused a lot of difficulty in our marriage, and eventually he left, and, and the marriage was over. When he left, we literally, I had $9.29 in a checkbook. That was it. Well, after two months of not being able to pay the babysitter, no matter how hard I stretched things, and at that point, really, I had no choice. And much to my dismay, I found myself somewhere I never, ever dreamed I would be. So I went to social services and applied and was eligible and then tried to look at what, what's next. But one of the workers looked at where I was with my schooling, had talked to me fairly extensively, and asked if I was going to continue going to school. And I said, well, the only way I can do that is to do it part-time, hopefully find another job, and get a Pell Grant and get assistance to cover books and tuition. And some professors really encouraged me to continue. I continued my education. So I was on welfare for a total of nine months. And, you know, it was an amazingly humbling experience. There is much we can learn from Patty's story. She experienced poverty and was at her wit's end through no fault of her own. A government program funded with our tax dollars came to her rescue and enabled her to obtain the education she needed to leave welfare, support herself and her family, and contribute to society. Admittedly, not all persons on welfare are as deserving as what Patty was, nor did they all take advantage of the opportunities given them as she did. But many do. It's simply wrong to put all poor people into one easy-to-condemn pigeonhole. We begin our consideration of poverty by noting one basic point the Bible makes time and time again. Psalm 146 says, the God of Jacob is a God who takes up the cause of the widow and the orphan. Uh, the God of Jacob is the one who takes up the cause of the poor. Uh, God is an advocate on behalf of the poor. And uh, it's so important for us to understand the, the spiritual teaching there. That over and over again, God says to the people of Israel, you were once orphans in the land of Egypt and I heard your cries. Uh, our obligation to the poor has a lot to do with the fact that God has reached out to us in our own helplessness and that we in turn need to reach out to those who are helpless, maybe in very different ways, uh, helpless because of the, the structures of oppression or poverty or, or, uh, or prejudice and, and, and the like. But it's very important for us to uh, take up the cause of the poor because God issues a warning that uh, if we don't take up the cause of those who need someone to stand up for them. How will we stand in the, in the day of judgment? Most Christians agree we have a God-given duty to help the poor. The principle of solidarity surely requires this. But what does that mean in concrete terms today? What should we do as individuals and what government policies should we support? The Old Testament laws that required the Israeli farmers to leave some of the grain in the fields for the poor to glean are a good place to begin as we think about these questions. And so there's a condemnation in the scriptures of those who are poor because of their own refusal to work. And I think those gleaning laws uh, uh, are, are really an encouragement not just to take the hand out, but to actually go and get that grain on, on your own. It's not easy to go from uh, ancient laws for an agricultural setting 
uh, to uh, contemporary business practices. But there are some underlying principles there that uh, I'm, I'm positive we have to take into account as biblical Christians. And that notion that uh, the farmer in the Old Testament uh, who is uh, reaping the grain uh, was required to leave some off on the edges there so that the poor could come and, uh, and take some of that. Uh, the underlying principle there was it's not all about us. It's not all about my profit. It's not all about what it can mean for me in terms of economic interest. But, uh, but even in conducting my daily business, I need to think about the concerns of the poor. Justice as a biblical principle is central. We are to treat the poor with justice, to work to assure that they have opportunities to provide for themselves and improve their situation. Today, this means educational and job training programs, not leaving some crops for the poor to harvest. But the principle is the same. Justice means we as a society owe something to the poor, but they also have a duty to take advantage of the opportunities they have been given. There was some level of required activity on the part of the poor. They actually had to show up um, to the land. They themselves had to, to do the work of gathering what it was they needed. That old adage or proverb that if you, teach, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. I think we need to operate out of that kind of philosophy. We need to equip people who uh, are struggling with skills, with education. Uh, we need to focus on their strengths and we need to help teach them how to help themselves out of poverty. So when government programs operate in that fashion, then I'm, I'm all in favor. In addition to the principle of justice, there is the biblical principle that insists on the importance of civil society and the need for public policies when helping the poor to work with and not undercut and replace the many Christian and other nonprofit agencies already doing much to help the poor. Breakthrough Urban Ministries in Chicago is a model of Christian faith in action. It can help us understand that helping the poor is not a matter of only private action or only government action. Sometimes the two working in partnership is the best answer. Our Christian faith is central to everything that we do at Breakthrough. It's part, it's our mission um, to demonstrate the compassion of Christ. And we do this through Bible studies and devotional times and our one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with everybody that comes to us. We have more than a thousand volunteers that come and serve here at Breakthrough. They provide meals for our homeless guests. They tutor, they coach, they mentor. Um, they do building projects with us and, and sort clothes and clean. Um, we're, we're very grateful for our volunteers. We also have a um, uh, majority of our revenue coming from private donations and family foundations. More than 50% comes from people who just really care about our mission and want to give us unrestricted funds because they believe in what we're doing and they see that the benefit that it's providing to the community and to the kingdom. And then we get about 20% of our revenue from government sources, everything from the, the neighborhood to the city to the state and the federal government for things like housing and employment training. And these, uh, these dollars are very helpful for us. We don't depend on the government for what we do. We're, we try not to be funding driven. We want to stick with our mission. But all of these revenue sources are very helpful for us to have a diverse uh, funding base is key. Our Lower Sutter and Breakthrough Urban Ministries are examples of civil society in action. Government is a part of God's will for human society, but so are families, churches, and nonprofit agencies such as Breakthrough Ministries. Remember the principle of subsidiarity? It says that government ought not to take over from civil society organizations that are already helping the poor. Instead, Government can often best assist the poor by helping to fund organizations such as Breakthrough Urban Ministries that are already doing good work and in other ways cooperate with them and support their work. 